Hello and welcome to module 13 where we'll be talking about three different major styles in the 18th and 19th century called Rococo, Neoclassicism, and Romanticism. These are three very different styles and we're covering a lot of time in order to start talking about modern art in module 14. We'll start with the Rococo which is this very fanciful and decadent style in stark contrast to the classicism or naturalism of the, of the Baroque period. It also is characterized by the use of a lot of pastels. Then we'll move on to talking about neoclassicism, and hopefully that word should spring to mind that it's looking to the past, neoclassicism, new classicism. And we see this interest in classicism in the style and the subject matter. We also see art characterized by rationality, and a lot of this is influenced by the period known as the Enlightenment. We'll also talk about romanticism, which focuses a lot on emotion, the exotic and the idea of the sublime, so these transcendent visions. And finally, we'll also look at an example of American landscape painting, and we'll see how landscape painting has a lot to do with national concerns in the U.S. of the 19th century. So a lot to get through today. We'll be focusing mostly on France, but again, with the American landscape, we'll be looking at one image from the United States. So let's start with this Rococo in 1715, Louis XIV dies, and changes occur in France that affect the political makeup of the country, as well as affecting the culture and the society. At this point, the aristocracy gain more autonomy. There's a move away from Versailles and back to urban centers, especially Paris, and the aristocracy become the biggest patrons of art. This shapes the kind of art that's produced and aesthetics, and leads to the style called Rococo. It's the style that appears in France and spreads internationally in Europe in the early 18th century. Now this word rococo comes from the French word rocaille, which means pebble. It's characterized as sensuous, organic, soft, luxurious, and elegant. It also initiated an interior decorative style in urban palaces and hotels, although I'm just going to show you two paintings from this style. In the architectural decoration, you see lots of stucco ornaments in the shapes of ribbons, leaves, stems, flowers, arabesques, and elongated curving lines that are applied to walls and ceilings. Maybe you can start to get a sense of why it's named after this French word for pebble. The effect of all of this was to blur the boundary between the walls and ceiling and to make solid surfaces look like fleeting illusions. Mirrors were often also incorporated and that helped to deceive the senses and chandeliers provide jewel-like lighting. All of these elements work together to create a glittering, luxurious setting for an ultra-refined society. The Rococo love of pastel shades is also conspicuous, even in the marble columns and polychrome floor tiles in architecture, but it's also highly characteristic of the paintings, as we'll see, as you can see right now. So the first image I want to talk about is by a painter named Antoine Watteau, and it's called The Return from Cythera. Sometimes you also see this called Embarkation for the Island of Cythera, and it dates to 1717. Watteau pioneered a new subject matter, and this is an example of that, that would become very popular, and that's called the Fête Galante, which means an amorous festival. What this is is depictions of outdoor entertainments or amusements of the French bourgeoisie and aristocratic society. So we see these groupings, of aristocratic people outdoors in bringing their mostly interior life outdoors with so this fanciful recreation. It's very, I, do, I don't think that a lot of aristocratic people actually did this. So what's going on here is this group of lovers, they're departing for the island of eternal youth and love. This island Cythera is from mythology and it was said to be sacred to Venus. Remember Venus is the goddess of love and she's a favorite subject for Rococo painters. The people in the painting are young, beautiful, and wealthy. Their costumes are gorgeous and elegant, not the most appropriate thing for a day out in the woods. It's a very sweet picture. It's not dramatic. It's very refined and elegant and almost poetic. You see this lush and idyllic landscape. It becomes very influential for other Rococo painters who painted similar scenes of love and leisure. This painting was Watteau's acceptance piece for entrance into France's Royal Academy. So remember Louis XIV founds this Painter's Academy in order to make this national style. This is what Watteau submitted 
in order to be accepted. Everybody had to submit a work in order to be accepted, and this was his acceptance piece. So all of the people in the landscape are young, luxuriously dressed, and they almost seem to perform this elegant ballet in the protective shade of a woodland park. Watteau carefully studied the attitudes of the figures, intending to find the most poised, smooth, and refined attitude for each one. So you've got a lot of different things going on here. On the right side of the painting, you see this ancient sculptural type called a herm, where it's mostly just from the waist up, and then it's a pillar down below. This is actually supposed to be the goddess Venus, and she's overseeing everything that's happening here. You've got the, this pair of lovers here. He's talking to her, trying to woo her. You see this pair here. The man is helping the woman up as they prepare to disembark. You see this pair, again, in these very elegant and refined poses, all going down this little hill to join their friends. You see their boat here. And this figure here must be some kind of nymph, the one who is half naked. And then you see all these little puti, these little cherub or cupid figures who are flying up, overseeing all of it, sort of blessing the scene. Watteau's brushstroke is extremely visible, and this is something we'll see more and more in painting at this point in time. And it's really nice for creating this atmospheric perspective in the background, which was to assume that Cythera is somewhere over in those mists. But it also works nicely for the sort of darker woods that they must have come from. Art historians have often noted that Watteau's themes of love and Arcadian happiness are slightly shadowed with some sort of wistfulness or even melancholy. And I think the trees and the woods and the darkness of this area sort of imply that to a certain extent. In the academy at this point, there are two rival factions of painters in the 18th century called the Poussinists and the Rubenists, and these are named after two painters from the 17th century, Nicholas Poussin, who's in your textbook, and Peter Paul Rubens, who we talked about uh, with the raising of the cross in the Flemish Baroque. And this is this idea of line versus color. It's very similar to that central Italian Venetian competition that we saw in the High Renaissance. Watteau is actually from Flanders, and you can see his interest in color rather than harsh outlines. And so you see this triumph of what are called the Rubenists in the academy with the rise of somebody like Watteau. I'd now like to show you this painting by Jean-Honoré Fragonard called The Swing. I think you can see why. And it dates to 1766. Fragonard was a student of another famous artist of the Rococo named Boucher. And he was also a follower of Watteau. Maybe you can see that in his depiction of the twisting branches of the trees. His brushwork isn't quite as loose, but there's still quite a bit of freeness to it. It's not super polished. Fagonard does many paintings of young lovers, and that's what we're seeing here. We see this young girl on a swing in this perfect pastel, froofy, poofy dress. We see her lover lying on the ground watching her here. He's hidden in these bushes. She sees him, but her companion over here who's pulling the swing only has eyes for her and has no idea that anybody else is around. So here we see an old bishop, he's a bit older than the figures around him, who's making, who's pulling these ropes, making this swing go back and forth. The lover is in this very strategic location, so he's hidden from the bishop, she can see him, but he can also see right up her skirt. And so can we to a certain extent, you can even see her garter belt at the upper part of her leg here under her skirts. Notice her shoe flying through the air, and it's got a very strategic art here. It's not just carefully slipped off her foot, she's kicked it off, aiming it for this figure of Cupid here, who has his fingers to his lips in this shushing gesture. So Cupid is sort of making it clear that there's some secret love affair going on here, and the woman, the young woman, doesn't want her old bishop friend who's swinging her to know anything about it. You see another classical sculpture in the background here, these two cupids who are riding a dolphin. You can see the dolphin's head just below, and this very large eye. So cupids and a dolphin, remember that has a clear association with Venus. We learned that way back with the Augustus of Prima Porta, and the same holds true even in the 18th century. It's set in this wilderness, even though, again, these figures aren't dressed for a wilderness experience at all. 
and these twisting branches up above lead into this darker area providing this certain drama that the figures below don't quite do. The figures are sumptuously clothed, showing the wealthy out in nature very much like Watteau was doing. But again, it's very delicately painted like we saw with Watteau, a bit more refined in the polishing of the brush strokes, but it's still got this looseness that gives it this certain quality, the sort of atmospheric effect that it sort of seems like a vision to a certain extent. And again, I'm going to emphasize this notion of the pastel. The Rococo is very interested in this. Now, this painting is actually quite large. And so the figures are not quite life-size, but almost. So it would have been this very dramatic scene to have hanging on your wall. And Fragonard does paintings like this for a lot of private patrons. So it's what a lot of aristocrats were interested in looking at. So these sort of games of love showing themselves out in nature. I mean, these are fictive people. They're not representing particular individuals. But this idea is something that aristocrats would have found very fun to look at in their private time. I want to show you one painting showing the influence of the Enlightenment. So hopefully you've noticed the strong difference between what we just saw with the Rococo and the darkness of this work of art called A Philosopher Giving a Lecture at an Orrery by Joseph Wright of Derby in the States to 1768. So just two years difference between this and Fragonard. This is most definitely not Rococo. The Enlightenment is a period where the basis is on empirical evidence and rational thinking. It's made up of philosophical thinkers whose names we still know today, like Newton, Locke, and Descartes. There's this interest in the acquisition of knowledge, and there's even more of a secularization than humanism of the Renaissance, so even more of a turn away from religion and an emphasis on the mind of man. They transferred their ideas to the socio-political world, and the Enlightenment becomes very important for the many revolutions that occur in this period. So 1768, we're not that far away from the American Revolution or the French Revolution. The Enlightenment is driven by what are called philosophes, and these are these French intellectuals who criticize the power of the church and who are very interested in the doctrine of progress. There's a strong emphasis on scientific investigation and invention, which leads to the Industrial Revolution and other technological advances. So things are changing very rapidly in the, in the 18th century, leading to what we think of as the modern world. In this work, we're moving for a moment to works produced in England, just to talk about this development in the 18th century. So this is a really good example of showing this new enthusiasm for learning and observation because of technical advances. Joseph Wright of Derby paints several scenes like this, of people fascinated by science and gathered around some kind of demonstration. That's exactly what we're seeing here. So this philosopher in the very center is in the middle of giving a demonstration to this group of people gathered around. Notice how nicely they're dressed. These are aristocrats who are interested in learning about whatever scientific advance this philosopher has made. This takes place in what's called an orrery, which is this place to keep birds. You see this bird cage in the background here. You see this bird in this glass orb, and he's doing a demonstration proving that if he turns a certain valve, that whatever instrument he's working with, the air will be cut off from the bird and the bird will die. And so you see this group of people. We have four on the left and four on the right, in addition to this boy in the background. So it's nicely balanced between five on each side. And you see a variety of reactions to what's happening here. You see this figure in the front right who is contemplating the scientific nature of the experiment. You see the two girls showing the fear and distress at seeing this bird about to die. And you see somebody like their father or just another aristocratic figure who's trying to say, no, no, look, you're going to learn something from this. Then you have these two figures who seem to be talking about what's going on over on the left side. This young boy who is fascinated by what's happening. And then this other man who's sitting and looking very intently as well. So lots of different attitudes to this scene. Notice Joseph Wright's naturalism that he's using here and this chiaroscuro to highlight these expressions and to create even greater a sense of drama here. He even sort of hides the light source. This lantern is hidden behind this vessel that has water and a skull in it. So it's a very interesting painting and it's a good example of what the Enlightenment is doing for painting.
Now I'd like to turn to this style called neoclassicism. This is a style of art and architecture that occurs in Europe in the second half of the 18th century, and it extends through the first half of the 19th century. Very broadly, it consisted of a return to the subjects and styles of ancient art, and a return to this, a strict adherence to classicism with contemporary interests in mind. This interest in classical subjects and the style was in part encouraged by the Enlightenment. Remember, because the Enlightenment has this emphasis on reason and empirical analysis and evidence for understanding the world and humankind. We see the secular philosophy, distinct from religion, notions of tradition, and myths and legends, which were considered a bit irrational. So even though they're interested in the classical path, they're not showing mythological scenes necessarily. Within the secular philosophy, there was this notion of progress, meaning that society could progress and improve systematically and with planning. Again, this influenced the revolutions against absolute rule from a monarchy. It supported this concept of the innate freedom of humans. So we see classical models, which provide an idealized image of civilization and political harmony. It was appealing to the Enlightenment philosophes and artists at the outbreak of utter chaos from these revolutions that start taking place in the later part of the 18th century. So the interest in classical models in their subjects allowed artists to re-represent timeless traditions of liberty, civic virtue, morality, and sacrifice for the betterment of state and society. Stylistically, classical and Renaissance examples were appropriately rational and harmonious with the neoclassical interest in simplicity, balanced proportions, and compositions. And we'll see a strong turn away from the vacuous elegance of the Rococo. Classical antiquity in this period also became much more available for 18th century audiences with the archaeological discoveries of Pompeii and Herculaneum. These allowed for this new insight into how ancients lived and their surroundings, and it fascinated all Europeans who had the means to travel to the area around Naples to see the ruins. So this is also the age of what's called the Grand Tour in the 18th century, where wealthy people, mostly from France, England, and Germany, would take year-long trips to go study the classical world. They would mostly go to Italy. Greece was sort of a dangerous place to go at this time because it was mostly overtaken by the Ottoman Empire, and so they mostly looked to Roman antiquity. They would go to Venice and Florence uh, to look at the Renaissance styles at that time, but they would go to Rome and Naples to look at antiquity in particular. And if you think of modern-day study abroad, it's sort of the descendant of the Grand Tour. So I want to start with this painting by a very famous artist named Jacques-Louis David. This work is called The Oath of the Horatii, and it dates to 1784. It's quite a large painting, about 11 feet by 14 feet. David gets rid of all the Rococo fluff that we saw with Watteau and Fragonard. You can see early neoclassical influences in the work of David's teacher, who teaches it to him. And David travels to Rome with this teacher. David is a follower of Poussin rather than Rubens in that academic struggle between the line versus color. So he's far more interested in how line can build up form versus color. Although he does use intense colors, as you can see in this work. In the neoclassical, it's all about being very serious and drawing on classical examples in art and literature. Hence the use of stories like what we're seeing here, the Oath of the Horatii, which would have been familiar to David's audience. The story that we're seeing here it's about the time that Rome and the city of Alba were at war. They'd been at war for a long time, and they decided that to resolve their problems, they were going to fight by individual combat. Rome had three triplet brothers called the Horatii, and Alba had three triplet brothers called the Curatii. The sisters of both of these groups of brothers were engaged to the other set of triplets, so there was a lot of anxiety about these people fighting. Either way, five of the six sons would die, meaning that many of the women would lose their brothers, but also five of them would lose their husbands. So the, the two sets of three brothers met on the battlefield, and all of them are killed except for one, and that's how they decided the outcome of the war. David shows this really dramatic moment in the narrative, where the Horatii on the left side over here, the three brothers who are embracing, 
They're swearing an oath. Their father is standing in the center, holding their swords. They hold out their arms in order to swear this oath to win or to die for Rome. So there's this really obvious message of civic sacrifice here. On the right side, we see the women and children all secluded from this really strong, these strong postures that they're in. They're having their own dramatic moment where they're all swooning and mourning the fact that they're going to lose several of their loved ones. They're very distinctly separated. And David uses the architecture of the room, this three, this triple arcade in the background to delineate the different groups of people here. The neoclassical painters, especially David, were part of the society leading up to the revolution. It's a continuation of this enlightenment thought, as I've said. This painting has been associated with the French monarchy. It was likely commissioned by the king or someone at his court at this time when the revolution, when revolutionary ideas were starting to spread a bit in France. It's not at the time the revolution is occurring, but think about the moralizing undertones here. You have these three brothers, citizens of Rome, swearing to their father, who could stand in as the king, if you think about it in these sort of metaphorical ideas, showing this notion of civic sacrifice, that they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the state. So this was a way of art being used to communicate ideas that people shouldn't have revolutionary thoughts, they should sacrifice themselves for the greater state, for France. So in the composition, this very ordered, rational separation of the three groups, and in the classicizing architecture of the background, in addition to the subject, which comes from even before the emperors of Rome, this was from the Roman histories of the Republic, you can see the neoclassical emphasis here. You can see that interest in the subject matter of antiquity, but also very careful compositional devices, ordered and rational, like they thought that art in antiquity and the Renaissance was. Now, David is a very interesting figure, and he manages to work both for the monarchy and for revolutionary figures he manages to not be one of these people swept up in this time of terror in the French Revolution and be executed for working for the monarchy. He's really strategic in his own politics. So here I'm showing you another work by David called The Death of Marat, and this dates to 1793. So the French Revolution breaks out in 1789, and David becomes a supporter and de facto promoter of the movement through art in paintings, in ceremonies, and pageants, things like that. He began working with images that were much more relevant for the revolution. So even though we can characterize this as neoclassical, we have a contemporary subject matter. So the neoclassical approach is more in the lighting and the composition than in the subject matter. What we see here is a portrait of Jean-Paul Marat, who was a friend of David and an ardent political writer who supported the revolution. He was murdered in 1793. He had the skin condition, which meant that he had to take a lot of baths, that being in the hot water helped him, helped his skin condition. He was killed while taking a bath by a woman who supported the royalist effort of the revolution. So here in the scene, we see this very tragic figure of Marat. He's in his bathtub which we only get a hint of that here, but we get that from the sort of nude torso, which is a classicizing thing in and of itself. His bathtub has been covered up by this block of wood and then covered with a carpet, because while he was in the bath, he often would work on his writing. You see the box here that holds his inkwell and feather and some papers, and you see this paper in his hand, the quill in his hand here, so we know that he's been at the activity of writing. These are all very accurate references to Marat. So this woman's name was Charlotte Corday, and we actually see her name in this paper that he's holding. David cites the murderer and the victim in this, as well as the date. And notice that grisly detail of the blood on the paper. We see the bathwater has turned bloody. We see his wound where Charlotte Corday has stabbed him. The blood has fallen onto the drapery here, and the bloody knife lies below him. Notice also that David has signed the work and identified the subject of Marat, means to Marat, so he's dedicating the work to him here. So there's this certain precision and clarity to the scene. It's a bit cold, 
and based on certain Renaissance models. And here Marat has been depicted as a martyr for the cause. You see the strong light coming in from the left side of the painting. You see all the shadows being cast here. The, the light falls on the head and face and the arm of Marat, emphasizing his learning, emphasizing the fact that he is a victim here, tragically assassinated while he's completely vulnerable in his bath. I'm hoping this reminds you of some works we've seen before. Notice the very blank background. There's not a lot of extraneous material in the painting, sort of like Caravaggio scenes, even more like the St. Serapion we saw by Zerberon, that emphasis on the pitiful state of the martyr who has been killed. So Marat is looking back to Baroque works. He's also looking back to classical works in order to compose the scene. It's a really great example of neoclassicism being deployed for contemporary concerns. I couldn't not I couldn't talk about neoclassicism and not talk about an example of architecture. So I wanted to show you one example of that. Here we're looking at a place called Chiswick House, which is near London. And the architect here is Richard Boyle, who was the Lord of Burlington, along with William Kent. And this building was begun in 1725. Boyle was this wealthy earl who loved Palladio. So hopefully this reminds you of what we've seen before. The earl collected Palladio's drawings and read his book, and he also knew Vitruvius very well. Neoclassicism, and especially Palladianism, appealed to the English because of its clarity and simplicity. So here I'm showing you Chiswick House at the bottom right and the Villa Rotunda, which we looked at by Palladio, and hopefully you see the similarities between them. So Chiswick House is a variation of this building. It's got simple symmetry like we saw before, a right, lot of right angles and harmonious proportions. At Chiswick House, we have just two porches instead of four, and we still have that emphasis on the domed central space, although you'll see here that Boyle has raised his dome a bit higher. It's a bit easier to see from the exterior. It looks classical and rational, but it's set inside a lot of irregular gardens, which was an, an English interest in this sort of wild aspect of nature. The interior, which I'm not showing you, is in stark contrast to the austere exterior. The interior decoration is very Baroque rather than this very clean and crisp neoclassicism. This is better to be considered Palladian classicism rather than neoclassicism. So Boyle is not basing his designs on Vitruvius, on classical models, but on what would Palladio do in this circumstance. So he's following this particular model of Palladian architecture, and he's interested in it for its simplicity, not its moral virtue. So he's interested in the architecture, not so much the ideas of the time of neoclassicism, but hopefully you can see just how similar these two buildings are. You got this extended portico. We've got him using Corinthian columns instead of Ionic. You've got very similar articulation of the exterior with a single window topped by a small pediment on both of these. You can see that Boyle has chosen to have these two dramatic staircases leading up to his portico, though, rather than the simple approach we see in Palladio. And remember, Palladio is looking back at things like the Pantheon. So Boyle is adapting Palladio's ideas to his particular needs. Now we'll move on to the style called Romanticism. This is a style that occurs in art, literature, and philosophy, and it is concurrent with neoclassicism, even though I'm going to show you some later examples than the neoclassical works we looked at. Even more specifically, it occurs between 1800 and 1840. It's a bit more broad between 1750 and 1800. They're just more focused in the first part of the 19th century. It's closely aligned with literature. It actually began as a literary movement. And especially influential were the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote The Social Contract in 1762. Romanticism promoted and fostered a yearning and thirst for freedom, political, personal, and religious. Although the Enlightenment fostered this yearning of freedom, the horrific aftermath of the many revolutions and the dictatorship of Napoleon led to a disillusionment with the so-called progress of rationalism and planned industrial and social development. Therefore, they thought that freedom was to be found through the imagination rather than through rational and empirical thinking. And this is one of the primary characteristics of Romanticism. If you were to use one word to describe neoclassicism, you might call it rational. 
Whereas if you were to describe romanticism with one word, you would probably call it emotional. There's this emphasis on emotions, sensorial effects, painterly and dramatic uses of texture, light and shadow and color, the exotic, the imaginative, and the sublime. There's a revival of medieval lore and subjects and of Baroque drama and of Venetian color and texture. It's primarily a movement in painting, although it also occurs in sculpture and some examples of architecture. The primary center of Romanticism is France, although it also occurs in England, in the United States, especially in landscape painting, and in Spain with the artist Goya. We're going to look at two paintings by the two of the most important Romantic artists from France, named Géricault and Delacroix. So the first work we're looking at is by Theodore Géricault called The Raft of the Medusa. This dates to 1819, and it's another huge painting. It's 16 feet by 23 feet. Jericho epitomizes the Romantic spirit and style as a person and through his work. He died very young. He committed suicide. He was very tormented personally. What we're looking at here, as I said, is a monumental work, and it can be considered a history painting. And history painting was considered the best genre according to the French Academy. So those were the most successful paintings, ones that were depictions of events, large scale works based on actual events. And even though I'm calling this a history painting, it's actually showing a very contemporary event, something that occurred in 1816. In 1816, a ship called the Medusa wrecked off the coast of Africa near Senegal. It was headed to Senegal in order to drop off settlers to the French colony there. The captain was to blame, and his appointment as captain was the fault of the monarchy. The man was of royal descent, so it was a good example of nepotism. The problem was that the captain and only a few select people on the boat were safe in the lifeboats, so the rest of the people on there, 150 lower class survivors, made a makeshift raft and were left adrift. They floated for 12 days on the water, and after the 12 days, only 15 of the 150 people were still alive. There's a lot known about the shipwreck, actually. There are trials that survive. We have testimony and eyewitness accounts of what happened. And on the raft and the people on it were wracked by death, insanity, famine, thirst, and cannibalism. So all of these things happened on on this raft, it was this horrific experience. So what we're seeing, the moment chosen here, is when the survivors finally seem to catch a glimpse of the ship that would eventually rescue them. Jericho actually worked with several different compositions and moments of the narrative until he finally settled upon this one. Some of his earlier sketches, though, that are similar to this, actually show the ship on the horizon. This one does not, which I think is kind of interesting because Maybe they are completely wrong. Maybe they're hallucinating seeing a ship. You get this really dramatic sense of what's going on here. And this, and the result of this, of this moment being chosen, is a very emotional impact. Other, there's lots of elements used to enhance the sense of despair and this frantic need to survive. You've got this strong diagonal starting from the lower left, which goes through this dead figure, the several dead figures who are all on this end of the boat. You see this man who is sort of guarding this body and very contemplative of what's going on here. And then the diagonal follows this group of figures who are looking and reaching up dramatically to the pinnacle here of this pyramid. They're holding up one of these figures who, who's waving this cloth up in the air in the hopes to be seen by the ship. You have gestures all pointing in that direction so the viewer knows exactly where to look. You've got a lot of light and shadow that also cause drama. There's a lot of movement. I mean, you even have this huge wave that seems to be coming up almost about to capsize them. This technique should look fairly similar to you. Remember with Rubens' elevation of the cross, you see that very strong diagonal showing a lot of movement and action. So Romanticism is unlike Neoclassicism in that the intellect was not the primary reception artists were trying to reach but instead the senses and the imagination and the emotions. They do this through these pictorial devices that were also exploited by Baroque artists, this chiaroscuro, these diagonals, and this emphasis on emotion. So in a lot of ways, it's a revival of the Baroque. 
So in this painting, it's rather heroic, but it's at the same time, it's really not heroic because you see the baseness to which people fall if they're in desperate circumstances, all these dead bodies. I mean, and there are not nearly 150 figures here, so you can imagine that some people have been sent away, dropped off the raft because they couldn't be kept there any longer. In Jericho's history of painting, compared to something like David's Oath of the Horatii, you don't get that strong emphasis on moral heroism and patriotism. Instead, Jericho painted scandal and horror rather than patriotic sacrifice. It sparked a great deal of criticism, showing political weakness and the corruption of the restored monarchy. So after the French Revolution, the monarchy gets restored for a period of time until a later revolution. So now let's turn to this painting by the other very well-known romantic artist, Eugène Delacroix. And this is called Liberty, Liberty Leading the People, and it dates to 1830. This is also a very large work, not quite as large as Jericho's, but this is eight and a half feet by ten and a half feet. It's a rare work for Delacroix. It's more political in nature than the majority of his works. And it's inspired by the uprising in Paris in 1830 of the Parisians who were against the Bourbon king, Charles X. It's not really showing an actual event, though. It's more imaginative and poetic in nature, so it's in keeping with the romantic interest in the imagination. The hero of the scene, the central figure, is this personification of liberty. She carries over her head, waving dramatically in the breeze, the tricolor banner of the French Republic. She's barefooted, so she's this sort of sacred figure in a way. She's not a real figure. She has her breasts bared, which is rather classicizing, and she's leading these people who are marching forward, climbing over the bodies of the fallen. So even after some of our compatriots have fallen, we will still rise because liberty is leading us. She wears what's called a Phrygian cap, which was an ancient marker of freed slaves. And she's also carrying a bayonet, a very a French style of gun that has this sword on the tip of it. She represents this idea of freedom that was so important to the Romantics. Now she's flanked by these generic types of Parisians. You have this young, rough boy brandishing two pistols, and a lot of people he's a lot of people say he's actually based on um, the figure from Victor Hugo's Les Misérables. You also have this mercenary in the background who's carrying this cutlass, this type of sword. And then between him and Liberty, you have this sort of French dandy who's a bourgeois Parisian, and he's holding a sawed-off musket. So you see various sorts of weapons, various sorts of people, but the emphasis is on Liberty and these three different figures in the foreground. The rest of the figures and events, it's in complete chaos and almost unrecognizable in the smoke and the destruction of the battle. So he's using the smoke of the battle as this sort of sfumato technique that we saw with Leonardo. In the foreground, though, you do have some emphasis on the fallen. They're probably the most visible figures. And again, this is a huge work. So these dead bodies are what is almost at your eye level, just below your eye level. You would see them very, very clearly. So it's got this poignant aspect to it as well. In the hazy background, he has set it in Paris. You see the towers of Notre Dame here and some of the architecture of 19th century Paris emerging from the smoke of the battle. It's got more of, it's more of a commemoration of the spirit of revolutionary idealism that occurred in this July uprising against the Bourbon regime rather than a, represent a representation of the actual act of liberty. This mixture of contemporary fact and poetic allegory was reflected in the original title of the work, which was the 28th of July, Liberty Leading the People. So it's meant to be this, idealized is not the right word, but this imaginative recreation of this event with certain types that represent the ideas of this revolution. And the Romantics were very interested in doing this. Delacroix and Jericho are both showing fairly contemporary events but romanticism could show a wide variety of things. Now I want to turn to landscape, and landscape is this other branch of romanticism. So romanticism encouraged a renewed interest in the power and poetry of nature. Poetry on nature abounds. Think of the Americans Ralph Waldo Emerson, 
or Life in the Woods by Thoreau. Philosoph the philosophy of the time period also promoted nature, especially in the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. There was, there was this concept of the spiritual power of nature and the ideal of the noble savage. Nowhere was the romantic, romantic interest in nature more evident than in the resurgence of landscape painting. Painters reveled in the majestic, spiritual, sublime, and sometimes terrible power of nature. There's two primary different ways to represent that nature. I'm showing you an example of each of these types. These are actually painted by the exact same artist, the British painter Turner. So on the left, we have what's called the picturesque, this idyllic, nostalgic kind of landscape. It's largely inspired by tourism, looking at ruins, and the rise of the Industrial Revolution. So there's a somewhat nostalgic sense of nature and a time that may be lost forever. By contrast, on the right, I'm showing an example of the sublime, which is showing nature imbued with emotional drama and impact. What we're looking at is a, the sinking of a ship here. You get this sensation of delight from a terrifying situation. And this is largely achieved through vivid color and brushwork. I think you can see how loosely handled the sublime landscape by Turner is compared to this picturesque one. Romantic landscape painting was especially pioneered in England, although branches of the genre also occurred in Central Europe and the United States. But I want to focus on this work by a famous American painter named Thomas Cole. And this work's official title is View from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm, but more commonly it's called the Oxbow, and it dates to 1836. Cole was an American painter and poet of English birth. He was the leading figure in American Romantic landscape painting during the first half of the 19th century, and he had a significant influence on the painters of what's called the Hudson River School. This was this group of artists who drew subjects from uncultivated regions, of the Hudson River Valley, and your book talks about that in some depth. Among some of these painters were Jasper Cropsey, Asher B. Durand, and Frederick Church, who was Cole's only student. Cole spent the years from 1829 to 1832 in England and Italy, and during this period he painted the Roman countryside in a manner suggested of J.M.W. Turner's influence, so the painter whose works I showed you just a moment ago. He often painted in a moralizing narrative style of landscape. So it might look like just a basic landscape, but there's often moralizing undertones to it, sort of like the Vanitas still lives we talked about with the Dutch Baroque. In works such as the Oxbow, he infused pure landscape with a dynamic sense of historical change. This is one of what he called his view paintings. And this dramatic view is from the top of Mount Holyoke in Western Massachusetts across an oxbow-shaped bend in the Connecticut River. Cole thought that ancient geological formations were America's antiquities, so he was interested in things like this. This oxbow would have taken centuries, millennia, to form the erosion of the landscape in order for the river to make this shape. You also get a sense of the rolling hills around the Connecticut River. On the left, we see this fading storm suggesting that the wild will eventually give way to the civilized. His increasing awareness of the clash between nature and culture is evident not only in his art, but also in his journals, poetry, and correspondence. So there's quite a dramatic difference between the left and right side of this painting. We're looking on the right side at this plain around the Connecticut rivers with a few hills, and we can see that the storm has just passed over this fairly barren landscape. You can see some cultivation that's happened here. If you look at sort of the patchwork qualities of the fields. So this part is where man has encroached. But notice there's not that much civilization depicted here. You see a couple of columns of smoke rising up from the landscape. On the left side, you have this much wilder sense. The storm is now over this uncultivated land that looks out over the river where man has not quite touched. The tree is in this very dramatic diagonal. It looks rather haunting. I say that man has not really touched this section, but that's not entirely true. We see these belongings of a human figure here, and right down here, he's really kind of hard to see. You see this human figure lost in this landscape. So Cole is really interested in trying to show how man is encroaching into the American landscape. 
And remember, he's interested in this dynamic sense of historical change because the U.S. in this period in the early 19th century, there's a lot of exploration of the West going on. There's a lot of settling of the West. There's this idea of manifest destiny, which follows this notion that man, the white man in particular, is supposed to go out and cultivate these areas. And this was how they thought it was this God-given right to own nature. It's got a lot of really interesting concepts behind it. It's what we don't have time to go into today. But if you're interested, there's a lot written about this idea of manifest destiny and a lot of landscape paintings encourage and discourage this idea. So painters are interested in taking up these political ideas, even through something like landscape. So we talked about a lot today. We started with the Rococo, this fanciful and decadent style that incorporates a lot of pastels. We also talked about neoclassicism, which looks to antiquity and the Renaissance in style and subject matter. There was this emphasis on rationality, and especially with the teachings of the Enlightenment. So it's, it's sort of like humanism taken to the next level. Man is the measure of all things, and, they, and there was this turn away from religion even. With Romanticism, we talked about emotion, about the sublime and the exotic. Remember, if you're going to describe neoclassicism with one word, you would use rationality or rational. With romanticism, you would say emotion. And finally, we ended with American landscape painting and how landscape was a way to think about national concerns. So now to finish module 13, you'll need to take the self-assessment. There is a discussion board prompt that is required. And then there's two opportunities for extra credit with this module. Since we have four modules this week, I thought I'd offer some extra credit. There's the potential for an audio post, and also anybody who would like extra credit can work on the vocabulary wiki. Make sure you include your initials so I know who that is. So thank you for watching, and I will see you for module 14.